everyone and welcome to the USPA webinar on the World Health Organization Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. My name's Rachel Sutherland and I'm a Translational Research Fellow from the University of Newcastle in Australia and I have Tom McKenzie with me and today it's our pleasure to chair this webinar on behalf of the ISPA Early Career Network and the ISPA Education Committee. So we're keen to make a quick start so we can maxim maximise our time listening to the presentation and allow some time for some questions at the end. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Fiona Ball. So Fiona will be presenting for approximately 45 minutes with some time at the end for some questions. And we're very fortunate to have Fiona present to us on the World Health Organisation Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. So Fiona is a former president of ISPA and is currently the acting director for the non-communicable disease and prevention team at the World Health Organization. Fiona has over 25 years experience in public health research with a focus on prevention of non-communicable disease, health policy and practice in the Australia, uh, sorry, in Australia, the UK and in the US. And Fiona has formerly worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US and has um, held positions at several academic institutions and is now at the World Health Organization. So it's our pleasure to now hand over to Fiona to um, present to us on um, the WHO plan. Well, thank you. Well, good morning to everyone. And can I first uh, thank uh, ISPA, uh, the Early Career Network, the Education Council, and of course, uh, everyone involved in ISPA and all of you joining this call. Thank you for organising it and your interest and um, timely opportunity to share to you all the, um, the launch and the activities around the new global action plan on physical activity. Um, I've put together a set of slides and I'm working on preparing a slide set that will be many of these slides available for um, open use by everyone. Um, so I welcome your feedback on what might be the short set that people would like to use. But what I'd like to do over the next 30 or so minutes is give a little background on the development and I'll go fairly quickly because on this audience I know many of you have either been directly involved or following very closely. I want to then spend most of the time on introducing you to what it is, what's inside it and what's it outlining and then thirdly I think much of you will be interested in next steps for how we help countries, how we involve stakeholders and improve and scale implementation and I'm very much looking forward to the opportunity for questions questions, discussions in this webinar or thereafter. So a backdrop here, and I think some of you may have seen this, it was prepared to introduce to many in the global consultation process, the sort of potted history. And it's really focused on the WHO potted history, but I've anchored it back in 1996 in the top left, because that was a game changing moment with the US Surgeon General's report on physical activity. I often liken it to the tobacco and health report, smoking and health report back in 1960s. And then it took some time for WHO to uh, gather together with the support of many and produce the Global Action Plan of Diet, Physical Activity and Health in 2004. Thereafter, some other resources and tools slowly emerged. And it wasn't until 2010 that we got the Global Guidelines, which again is an important landmark document for many countries who can't afford or have the resources and expertise to do this lengthy process. But really, I think many of us would say that actual implementation was still very patchy and very slow. And so it was the um, 20, uh, 2011 UN declaration and the forecasting of the um, increasing profile of N NCDs, the need to focus on NCDs. And of course, ISPA was um, very much involved in this with the development of the uh, Toronto Charter in 2010. And then the seven best investments document to really pinpoint we do have effective interventions we know what to do, we need more action. All of this helped improve and contribute to WHO's 2013 Global Action Plan. In that document, it has one section, of course, including physical activity, and that in itself is very important. And I think we've passed that point where physical activity is neglected, but let's watch out for that. It sometimes still is in different places, but it was there as one of the core risk factors, page 33, and it provided broad policy guidelines. Appendix 3 had a little more detail, because it had the list of cost-effective interventions which had used the WHO uh, choice economic analysis tool. But for physical activity, there was only one 
Best Buy, and that was the mass media campaigns. Another landmark um, contribution of this window, the 2013 or so era, was the development of a global goal. And this is shown on the right hand side and you're all familiar with it. The problem was this wasn't enough. The goal was set, but the guidance was pretty high level and there appeared to be only one effective cost effective intervention. Now, the good news is that since 2013, indeed this year, we have updated, we being WHO, have updated the Appendix 3 and repackaged it into a much more outward facing standalone document. And it's important to know about this because this is a go to tool if countries are looking for what to implement to tackle NCDs. The cost effective ratios are shown on the right hand side and you can see a Best Buy with uh, less than $100 uh, dollars, international dollars per DALI, a good buy and then other recommended where the definition is it just simply hasn't been processed through the choice analysis. So what does this document say now in 2018 for physical activity? As you scan this you'll quickly see again the mass media up there in red a Best Buy. A good buy is counselling and referral based on a systematic review, cost effective analysis. And then those recommended where there are Lancet uh, uh, journal special issues, other systematic reviews, other profiled consensus statements on the importance of these areas. These are all included. Again, however, progress is slow. The data are showing and we'll come back to looking at how uh, the recency of data, but right now the available global data show the 23%. But look at the bottom graph where we can see, and probably many of you know in your own countries and your region, that in fact there's great variation. The global estimate is pulled down by India and China in the Ciro region, the Southeast Asia region, because of their sheer size of population and they have lower levels. But look at the Americas. Look at Middle East, look at West Pacific, and let's look at one of those regions at the bottom, and it is the Middle East, and you see 60, 70, 75%, and always that pattern between men and women. The last point on this slide is useful to show to your governments, to your stakeholders and your advocacy work, is that as countries change and economically develop, these data show physical inactivity increases. Look at the upper middle and then high income. So the changes in transport, work, recreation, leisure, communications are changing how we live and that's shown in the data with higher levels of inactivity. And it was all of this that set the stage back last January for WHO member states, the countries, to call upon the need for more action on physical activity and indeed a new document bringing the evidence and best practice forward. They wanted us to link to the SDG agenda and they wanted to have the specificity what do we need to do and many of you will have known much of that but it's a useful backstory for us setting the stage for the work that unfolded so the last 12 months has been developing and you can see in the middle here the process that took place a very busy period in the middle of last year because it had to culminate to reach the um, governing bodies of WHO to formally be an agenda item at the executive board in January 2018 shown in blue at the bottom and that's a necessary step to get to the agenda of the World Health Assembly. So essentially in about eight months from the request to start we undertook regional consultations, open online consultations, briefings to country offices here in WHO, briefings to UN agencies, held webinars, many surveys were done and a big thanks to ISPA who contributed to a survey along with ISBNPAR to collect views, insights from the wider community. Really successful and I think very engaging and very, very useful. This slide just shows you a happy photograph of a group that's finished a three day meeting, but more importantly for you is to look at the diversity of the groups that were involved. And this is a theme that runs through both in all the consultation and of course in the document itself. Of course there was health, but moving beyond just the clinical to the public health, the um, gerontology, the physical therapy, the sports medicine, making sure everyone's involved. Nursing was also included. The sports sector reaching out and engaging actively with the diversity of sports organizations, transport and planning. Of course, the research community and ISPA and ISBNPA were represented along with other networks like Ajita Mundo and our collaborating centers. 
the process of consultation, um, many of you know, and I hope you contributed, was wide and varied, and I won't go into too much detail, but perhaps just to show you here a busy photo collage, because in each of the meetings, they were not only capacity building, um, because some of the sessions were training and lectures on physical activity and discussions about the status of physical activity in their country, but of course then a diagnostic and critique of the draft action plan back last August and September. You can see some sticky notes, and that was an important exercise where participants were being asked to look at each of the proposed actions, what's missing, what should be refined or clarified, and how relevant and how feasible are they in your country context. You can start to see a pattern emerge, and if I just focus on that sticky note right in the centre of that photograph in the middle of the page, we can see a sort of pattern. There's certainly more to the right, and that's good news. That means there was medium relevance or high relevance on that right-hand side. There was also medium and high feasibility. But you can see there's variation. So in some countries, some of the actions are less relevant and in some countries they're less feasible, even if they're relevant. And this is the story and the situation that we'll go forward with in how to um, uh, implement the Global Action Plan. But hopefully it certainly pr provides the underpinning rationale for why there is a diversity of measures. There's not just three things we all must do. There are many things and some are more relevant and more applicable and more feasible in different countries in the short term and then the medium and longer term. We'll come back to that idea and discussion towards the end. But this, the consultation involved ministries of health, often sports, sometimes transport, academics and others. And these are just photos from the uh, official WHO processes and others were discussing um, and contributing in different ways. I also want to highlight that the result of that process leaves a, a, an interested and willing audience across those countries. And so these are the final photographs from each of those four face-to-face -face meetings. And in Europe and Africa, it was done online, virtual webinar uh, with discussion and workshop activities. So we'll come back again, and perhaps that's triggering your ideas about how to reach out and engage this um, uh, interested, willing and ready audience. I want to also mention to you, which is less familiar, but a very important agenda. WHO and the United Nations Systems is very much wanting to work better together. And there is an organization called the UN Interagency Task Force. And we sought an opportunity to have a workshop where they were here in Geneva to introduce the Global Action Plan in its development and seek their input. The important part of this was to seek the synergies. Where does the agenda of health and physical activity specifically intersect with UNDP, with UNESCO, with UN, UN Habitat, with UNICEF, with um, other UN agencies, some which are much less familiar. So what they're doing in these photos is going around the room and identifying the action areas where they're interested and think there's synergies to work with. We followed up on this November meeting with a February workshop. And I'm delighted to say the output of that is an established thematic group of this UN task force. So the opportunity now to work with different UN agencies on collaborative projects. The summary of everything of the uh, consultation process is on the left, and I don't want to dwell too much, but it was very positive about many of the aspects, certainly the links to the SDGs, the whole of system, the relevance and the need and usefulness as a guide. There was, of course, on the right, many requests, things to shorten, to then extend, to provide more detail and to address priorities. So it was with this set, which I've summarised very broadly here, that we revised the Global Action Plan plan into its um, next version. A version that went to the executive board and a draft resolution that was developed and finally we, went to, we reached May 2018. And so I'm delighted to show this slide because it shows a final resolution on the left and the full endorsement that was provided uh, in that resolution of the um, Global Action Plan. 
One of the important things about the resolution is it's the statement of member states' reaction and their uh, uh, enthusiasm, and therefore full endorsement is the um, maximum um, and highest uh, regard, if you will, for the, um, the uh, opportunity and the uh, material presented. And over 40 countries contributed with um, an intervention, uh, uh, spoke to the agenda item over an hour and a half. But what's important is their requests. Not only did they endorse the document, they um, encouraged all countries to implement and had five requests. And these are important for us because the first one was a request from countries to help implement. How do we start and how do we build those multi-sectoral collaborations? Reach out to the partners. Number two, was they invited us to finish the monitoring and evaluation framework that's needed to track progress and implementation as we go but from 2018 to 2030. Number three, to produce a global status report. And this was proposed as a um, high level, visible, prominent reporting and advocacy tool and the timeframe was set for 2020. Fourthly, to update the 2010 global guidelines on physical activity for youth and older adults. Many countries noted that these were now somewhat old in 2010, evidence has changed, issues have advanced and the guidelines for countries should be updated and many countries rely on the WHO guidelines, um, particularly outside of Europe and North America. And fifthly, they ask for the rep report on progress. And so there's now three opportunities going forward, three requirements to report on progress. So they're all linked because we need the monitoring framework that can provide the structure to the global status report that can um, describe, show and advocate for where we are now and where we need to go in 2020. We need the guidelines to support those e efforts and we need to produce reports in addition to the 2020 status report, formal contributions to the World Health Assembly in those three timelines. So I'm delighted to say that after that endorsement, within two weeks, we were launching the global action plan in football in uh, Lisbon at the uh, centre um, and the home of the national football team in Portugal, hosted by the Ministry of Health, the Portuguese Football Federation and attended by the Prime Minister of Portugal and the Director General of WHO. And I'll tell a little bit more about that because now I want to get into detail. What does the action plan say? Well, firstly, the mission, more active people for a healthier world, setting a short phrase, a, a tagline, if you will, for the general, uh, general direction, more active people, and it's healthier world in the broadest sense, healthier people, healthier planet, healthier environments. Of course, how will we get there is in this mission, and it's about providing access to all people of safe, enabling environments but with also the diversity of opportunities to be physically active in their daily lives. We linked to that original target, the 2025 target, but by aligning with 2030 sustainable development goals, we set an extended goal out to 2030. And this was calculated to be a 15%, five extra percentage points to reach for 2030. The structure of the Global Action Plan is around four objectives shown here. And within it, there are 20 policy actions. And what I'd like to do is take you through each of those very briefly. So the first um, action area and the objective is to create active societies. And it really hones in on a frequent um, uh, point made in the consultations that some of the issues are that the cultural norms, attitudes and general priority of being active in your life is not important in many countries and cultures. And that is true actually within countries and cultures. And so one of the um, uh, important parts of this objective is to have actions that will help create a paradigm shift, enhance knowledge, understanding and shift norms and values to valuing physical activity at all ages, for all abilities and uh, for all people. There are four actions that are designed to contribute and achieve, accomplish this objective. The second objective is to create active environments. 
And this perhaps is um, fairly self-explanatory and much of the newer evidence of the last decade really supports this and underpins the importance. We need the safe spaces and places. They need to be accessible and they need to be affordable and they need to be available to all people. We know that there are great inequalities uh, or inequities in access um, to uh, healthy spaces, green parks, public open spaces, affordable opportunities to be active. So this puts the focus on creating the safe spaces. Of course, it's got a very strong theme of urban design and the transport systems and making sure we have the infrastructure, whether that's walking infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, sports and recreation infrastructure through public open space and sports facilities. And it's about the policies and those sectors working with us um, and prioritizing this agenda. The third is creating active people, and it picks up on a point I've mentioned, which is about the need for more opportunities and programs across multiple settings, tailored and appropriate for different audiences and um, population groups so that they are adapted and um, uh, meet the needs, levels of participation um, and concerns of some, those with disabilities, older adults, those who, communities that have been marginalised and don't engage in mainstream opportunities provided in mainstream venues. How do we address the differences that we see at country and global level in levels of participation by age, by gender, uh, by race, by ethnicity, by um, different cultures? So this is about providing the programs and I always comment that this is about the exciting ways that new ideas of how to provide uh, programs come and try and variations of ways to be active, noting that there are many ways to be active. Lastly, this is the bread and butter, creating active systems. It's the objective that picks up on the important areas which many of us know underpin and drive good effective um, uh, practice public health practice we need the policies countries need a national policy and action plan guidelines and a multi-sectoral engagement and coordination we need training and building workforce capacity we need advocacy the data systems like surveillance, surveillance of behaviour, but surveillance of the environments and, and opportunities as well. And of course, we need to mobilise more resources, in other words, more funding or reallocation of existing funding to support these efforts to promote physical activity and to reduce sedentary behaviour. And let me use that as an opportunity to mention that it was important for many countries to recognise the role of sedentary behaviour. And so what the latest uh, and final version does include, of course, the importance of reducing sedentary behaviour as we promote physical activity. The 20 action areas I'm going to show in this single slide. And this was in the document many of you hopefully have seen. It shows the four objectives I've just spoken to with the relevant summary headline of the policy action that is required. And there are 20 of those smaller circles. But what's critical about this is the fact that it's shown as an integrated, inter, uh, interconnected system. And this was one of the new ideas and an important framing that we introduced into this global action plan. Many of you are familiar with this idea that, in fact, we do need the multi-sectoral approach. But we're less good at really communicating how interconnected actions in one area can be to supporting other areas. In other words, this tries to break down the silo of action and build the fact that this is a collective effort that's required and the interconnections and uh, feedback and progress in one area can help others. It's also a very simple diagram to show and rather colourful. We'll come back to this idea of the whole of systems shortly. You'd be very interested in perhaps asking, but where's the detail? How are those actions just shown in that systems model going to be introduced? And the detail is in Appendix 2. Necessarily, that makes it easier to at least get the main message in the front half of the document, but the detail, and almost the other half, is in fact how to do this. And so I'm showing you just one example of one page to introduce the structure to you. For every objective, and here we just have the first objective, creating active societies. Each of the actions are shown and the proposed or recommended policy action, 
supporting activities for member states, which means ministries of health and other ministries in all countries, actions for WHO, and that's at all levels, sometimes headquarters, the regional offices and the country offices that play different levels of importance and, and capabilities, and thirdly, for stakeholders. And that's the collective group, which on every page has got the footnote to explain that that's everyone else. That includes um, the academic community, the civil society, the non-state actors, the private sector, philanthropic, funders, research organisations, etc. So you can now see the rubric for any action you're interested in. You can interrogate what is being proposed and suggested. And we hope that this reflects the very best of all the consultation feedback. So where are we? Well, we created the um, and finalised the formatting. And um, here are the cover pages of the two documents now available on the new website of the Global Action Plan. On the left and at a glance, this is a six sider, which I hope you download. And I've got some hard copies and um, looking forward to being able to translate into um, more languages and, and print more copies, but invite others to, um, to circulate the at a glance. And on the right, of course, is the full lengthy document um, uh, with all the appendices and details. I invite you to visit the new website, which has got some of these. This is where you source these. And of course, we're going to use that going forward as um, a, a portal and a forum for us all to communicate and for you to keep in touch with what WHO um, is doing. The launch, which I introduced at the beginning, was held on June 4th, so just two months ago, and as I mentioned, was hosted by the Prime Minister of Portugal and um, had the pleasure of the Director General, Dr Tedros, attending in person to launch the Global Action Plan. An absolutely stunning stage was set using the uh, colours and um, icons of the Global Action Plan, and a full day of activities was involved. Uh, Dr Tedros met with the Ministry of Health in the morning and, and heard much more about the Portuguese agenda for physical activity. At lunchtime, we hosted a, um, a mayor's lunch with uh, over 70 mayors from across Portugal and a number of invited guests attended to uh, discuss the role of physical activity and the role of healthy cities. And then we went to a workshop, which was from two till five, on the importance of promoting walking and cycling before the formal ceremony that was focused on the entire document and of course um, very much uh, flavoured by the idea and presence of the football association and um, being located in the football and therefore the role of sports. I've identified just two of the quotes from the doc uh, Director General's qu uh, uh, speech uh, which I thought would be of interest to you and I thought rather important. He highlighted that of course it's not a single sector that can solve physical inactivity and creating an active society requires us to work together and that's an important quote for us to use with our um, colleagues for health ministries, for other ministries to engage. And then of course the call for highest level of political commitment. The frustration that we all share and we know is true in other areas of NCD prevention but we need to have that commitment, the bold decisions and these are being taken in various countries. I think it um, requires us now to celebrate those bold decisions and, and share those so that other um, ministers, prime ministers and certainly um, uh, in the health sector can show leadership. What we have also is a collection of other materials and in the middle of this you see a football. I'm pleased to say that we developed a football that was um, tailored to the um, Let's Be Active, the More Active People for a Healthier World campaign uh, and it in provides um, six messages replicated in six languages um, around, the, around the football. Um, we also created a video and it's a very nice opportunity for a pause. If I um, unshare my screen, I'd be delighted if the coordinators would be um, able to share with the audience today uh, the Let's Be Active 90 second video. Thank you. We live in a world beating with urgency, breathing with difficulty, breaking under necessity. We are a society consumed by technology, compact in proximity, 
choked by inactivity. We are global. We are responsible. We are trending. We are too inactive. Everyone. Everywhere. Every day. We have a plan. It's time to activate our governments, to activate our environments, to activate our society, to activate ourselves. It's time to activate movement, to activate improvement, to reverse our direction, to activate new trends. We need to alert you. We need to activate everyone, everywhere, every day. Thank you very much for showing you that. And I'd like to extend my thanks or take the opportunity to extend my thanks to, to many who contributed the, uh, the video clips. There's over 190 of those in uh, that 90 seconds, um, particularly the um, European Cycling Federation, Walk 21, and a number of researchers who uh, went to their archives. And a very big thank you to the um, IOC, the Olympic um, International Olympic Committee um, TV channel, which um, created the video on our behalf and an example of already working with the sports sector uh, to create something of a shared um, shared tool. This is available and freely um, uh, open for use and indeed the Director General has asked us to create that in the six languages of the UN. I've mentioned let's be active and of course um, with that video uh, we wanted to introduce and provide and respond to one of the country's major um, agendas when they asked for the new global action plan. We've got to build uh, a momentum around this issue. Many of us have been working in this field for a long time, but we haven't got a unified message that we say to everyone all the time. And so WHO created Let's Be Active as its contribution. And we're hoping that many countries and other organizations may join in and support this. You'll see the tagline, everyone, everywhere, every day. And I think many on this audience can understand that that's about everyone, abilities, age, sex, gender, countries, citizens, urban everywhere again in locations within schools home communities also in all countries and every day is speaking to the frequency that we need to encourage everyone to think of it every day and ideally be active every day the logos are under development and almost final but I do need to get those signed off and then this will be all available again on the website so what's next let me um, flag the agenda the global launch is done and regional launches are under development where regions are identifying an opportunity in the next six months, sometimes in the next six weeks. In fact, the first will be in, um, in October, early October, um, to identify the um, uh, a, a, a meeting where relevant audiences, particularly ministries, governments, as well as stakeholders will be there to raise awareness, visibility, advocate and engage. The, WHO system has regional committee meetings where all countries are present for their regional meeting. And so we're looking at promotion and side events there. But in addition, and I welcome you to think about with your um, various hats and the activities you're doing, how can you promote and use the tools which I've shared to you on this call? So partner-led events, conferences, forums, symposia, side meetings, etc. We need to use this moment, this opportunity of the next six, 12 months of the launch, of the newness and the freshness of this to promote. But the business end as well is responding to the resolution. So I've mentioned the monitoring framework and very briefly, you can see the outline steps. A lot of work has already been done on this because we have fully anticipated this need. And then we'll continue with um, uh, to, to finalize a draft um, with uh, various experts helping to complete that first draft. There'll be a, a consultation meeting and I've finished this slide this morning as things start to lock in. It looks like that will be in September. An open online country uh, consultation and that will be all a global consultation, not just country consultation over the one month of October to early November, finalize in November, translate and release 
and meet that deadline of December. What will it look like? Well, at the moment, and for this purpose, let me just flag the direction. I've introduced the four objectives, the 20 actions, and so we need the indicators and metrics. We need to identify how we will track progress as well as impact and ultimately the outcome, which of course is meeting the targets in 2025 and 2030. So we're looking for the indicators and metrics that will um, correspond to the contents of the 20 actions. And this work is under, in underway. And also, these are measures that might fall out of traditional health sector measures. For example, in the urban space, the transport sector, in physical education or the sports area. What are the monitoring indicators we're going to use? How will the data be collected? Who will be responsible? So it has to be both practical but ideally comprehensive. And that's going to be the challenge of the next eight weeks to, uh, and uh, 12 weeks to complete. In addition, we want to support countries implementing. Remember their first request, provide support for the implementation and multi-sectoral um, collaboration. So we need how-to guides, but we don't want to duplicate what might already exist as long as it's current, up-to-date and evidence-based. We've identi identified four areas and work is already commencing. We certainly need to help countries update, review, and if they don't have one, develop a national action plan. Some tools already exist. We need to guide, signpost or guide how to do this process. Number two, the Best Buy and one of the um, core uh, components of achieving objective one is increasing public awareness, understanding and value of physical activity. And so action 3.1 and 3.2. Correct me, that's 1.1 and 1.2. Three. Integrating of primary hair, uh, in, integrating of physical activity into primary and secondary health care, that is action 3.2 and also the NCD goodbye. It links very much with a focus that particularly our Director General and countries have currently got in improving and strengthening healthcare services. We have an important window to make sure that the primary prevention and secondary prevention of physical inactivity is included in that healthcare service for all people. This boils down to the sorts of approaches of advising, measuring, assessing, um, advising and referring and this tool is well advanced. And fourthly, we know there was a strong interest of high relevance and high feasibility on promoting physical activity in the school setting, primary and secondary school. And so we have prioritised this as the fourth area. But there are many more areas. And so we can see that there is probably a requirement for more tools, but we want to take a careful stock of what already exists. There's also a strong focus on innovation and the use of digital in particular. And with a Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative here at WHO with the International Telecommunications, we've already started to develop a phone based behaviour change programme on physical activity. If you can use your phone to quit smoking, can you use your phone to be more active? Now, we know there are a whole variety of apps and we know there are many researchers working on the best way and evaluating to use the phone and other technologies to help and support people to be active. We're very interested in collaborations in this space. And of course, the digital and the measurement are closely linked. And there's an agenda, of course, to update our measurement and surveillance um, uh, evidence and support countries ensuring that they're doing surveillance and using the best measurement tools. The third area I want to mention is the request to help build multi-sectoral partnerships and stakeholder engagement. So I've drawn on a diagram that was in the at a glance. This is not in the main report, but is in the at a glance brochure. And it's a pie of the links between physical activity and 13 SDGs. And Appendix one of the full report has the narrative of this, the longer text version of how exactly a policy action on physical inactivity can have co-benefits to other sectors. But for the at a glance, we captured that in this diagram. And what I invite some discussion on is how this can best be used and invite your use of this and support to ministries of health to use it to reach out to departments of trade, industry, economic development, to make the case in education, in sports, for how we can get win-win-wins on physical activity policy. 
but we know we must talk their language. It's the outcomes they're interested in that are on this page, not the reduction of deaths and dallies, um, uh, cardiovascular disease or cancer. We know those and they're in SDG 3 in green. So I've come to the end of the presentation where I've introduced the reason why we were asked to develop it, its contribution to the landscape of physical activity, what is the physical activity action plan and its 20 policy actions around four uh, strategic objectives and flag several of the areas which we're working on. Digital, the monitoring framework, tools for implementation and building stakeholder involvement. And I'd be delighted to take any questions for clarification or comments and suggestions of what others can do to support this new agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was a fantastic presentation and um, it was so lovely to hear about the plan from its early inception to um, where you are today, particularly thinking along the lines of um, monitoring and um, getting it into implementation. Um, for those that are listening to the webinar, if you would like to um, use the chat function to send through any questions, I've had some questions come through already, so I might um, start with those. So the first one, Fiona, is um, what you see is the most important step for researchers, practitioners, and um, for all of us listening today, for translating this um, WHO action plan into regional and local action. So what steps could we take as, um, I guess, academics and researchers and practitioners to try and, I guess, promote um, where the action plan is up to and, I guess, get our stakeholders involved in some action on the ground? Well, thank you. A, a discussion on that could, could go for some hours, if not days, uh, uh, but I welcome it. Um, so let me give a, a, a brief response. Firstly, you're all advocates. You're knowledgeable, you're interested, you're supportive, and you are the key to communicating this to the wider audiences in your countries. It will rely on you, um, and it will rely on you reaching out and being proactive. So with the launch, with what you've just heard, with this webinar link, make contact with your Ministry of Health um, and, and identify the person who is already working on physical activity or trying to work on physical activity, uh, and if not, the NCD director or lead. Um, lead. But not only in health, uh, connect up with sport, perhaps you might, and other ministries. You might even consider, uh, in addition to one-on-one -on -one contact that's so powerful, organize a forum or a seminar or a um, promotion of this around some of um, the uh, 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 physical activity work going on in your town, community, city or country, because then you could actually convene some of these um, multi-sectors together and the other stakeholders and really pivot off that whole point that everyone's got a role. And so the systems diagram shows that and the policy actions um, then articulate those different roles. You may choose to focus on specific areas, the link with sport, the link with transport and walking and cycling. And indeed, use those if they are particularly important, if road traffic uh, accidents are particularly getting a lot of um, uh, priority or public attention or political attention, use whichever area you can use to open the door and have the conversation. Because it may not be we need to promote physical activity, but if we need to improve the transport system and improve air quality, that's the door and you open it and go through and start talking about the role of walking and cycling in reducing um, air pollution and improving communities. In the research space, I think the biggest gap is showing um, ultimately that how, of, how a whole of system intervention, a whole of community intervention can work. And many of us might actually count on one hand a number of published papers uh, reporting um, robustly evaluated whole of community interventions. We need many more of those. We, we don't need many more um, individual interventions on things that are uh, individual research studies on interventions which have been proven already. We need to show how we do those in the real world um, as part of and contributing to um, a whole of system approach. So there's two areas, directly be an advocate and then in the research space start to look at how you can help your countries and help uh, propose new um, projects which will bring your skills in the evaluation space. 
Let me add the third, which I should have said perhaps first or second, and that is, of course, assess your country's position. Has it got the action plan? Does it need updating? And can you now look at how it can be improved? And that was the number one tool that I mentioned. And we'll need support for that on the ground in a country because WHO simply doesn't have the capacity to do this and it shouldn't. It should only help. But what is needed is stakeholders to participate in that. And so I think uh, you as leaders in this field, as knowledgeable experts from your perspectives, uh, play a really important role in helping countries tackle um, the, the physical activity governance side with policies, recommendations and new action plans. Happy to go into more detail, but let me leave it there for, on that question for now. That sounds fabulous. Thank you, Fiona. I've just had a couple of um, questions come through via the chat box, so I might just read those out. One says, how could young persons, the youth and young adults and young researchers and young program evaluators be involved in the development and running, oops, the development and running of the monitoring and evaluation framework going forward? Okay, Thank lovely. Oh, thank you for the um, the uh, implication of your question, which is an interest to be involved. Well, certainly through the um, online consultation. So when we have a draft, that will be available. It will be posted on the website I've indicated, and it will invite people to discuss and share comments. But doing that as an individual is often very difficult. So um, how about maybe some of the um, early career and the um, researchers that are referred to getting a group together and preparing a group response, critically assess the proposals, um, uh, proposed measures, um, and, and uh, respond in written format to, um, to the opportunity in the October uh, window that I'm suggesting. That's one way. Um, going forward, of course, there'll be the additional role of then looking at whether those data are being collected in the, um, in the countries. And I anticipate there will be some areas where, in fact, we may still need to develop the measurement instrument. Um, so I think a careful look at the proposed monitoring framework and its weaknesses or gaps will indeed identify opportunities for working on the science of how do we measure and monitor something effectively and efficiently because resources are very limited and people's capacity to measure more so it needs to be done preferably in simple um, and almost um, already, already collected data that's yet to be used for this purpose. So there's a couple of ideas. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'm going to read one out that came in to us prior to the webinar going forward from someone that couldn't join. Um, but this one says, will there be support and resources available from WHO to help countries implement the actions within the plan effectively? If so, what will these be and how will they cater for both countries starting from scratch and other countries that have ongoing activity plans? Uh, uh, um, an opportunistic question. Um, WHO is not a funding agency, I'm afraid. Uh, indeed, you're maybe well aware of our own funding um, uh, constraints. So um, the opportunity for uh, funding resources from WHO, certainly at headquarters level, is very slim. Uh, that is why you see at the list of actions being focused on um, high level advocacy, the monitoring framework and the tools. Now, where there's much more opportunities at the regional level, and at the country level, because really this is a lever. Now that there is clarity and global consensus on what to do, then we should be, and you and others, should be applying and looking for the funding support, whether that's from philanthropic sources, from within government itself, a reallocation of resources, or other opportunities through your research interest that you can do a practical and applied translational research. This is what we need to do, so apply for the funding that can lead countries and then evaluate it. So. <clears throat> I'm afraid to say that there is no direct resourcing opportunity from WHO, but only the opportunity to leverage this as the um, content by which and to strengthen applications for funding and your proposals with collaborations in your country. Lovely. One other that came in prior, um, Fiona, will there be any, oh sorry, that's the same question. Is um, There is a range of actions available for the relevant personnel in the plan. Are there any plans to evaluate what combination of actions will work best for particular 
So uh, I guess understanding what the best buys are yeah. in, in decreasing physical inactivity. Yeah, very nice idea. Um, and I think all of us know that, in fact, there's some um, not only limited data already on uh, some, and of course, that's why we are where we are today, that a whole of community approach is, um, uh, is the ideal um, direction for our approach to physical activity. But we have very limited data to be able to say that um, A, B and C or E, F, G are better combinations. But I think we will get good learning as countries start to develop. The um, logic, if you would, would be that we need to have at least um, activities in all um, the three areas of awareness, knowledge and, um, uh, and, and value change, the social norms. So that part of the Best Buy implementation is almost an umbrella and that's been recommended for over a decade or more um, and then there are the two components the environments and the opportunities now the specific nature of what environmental improvements are needed in Bangladesh um, or Dakar or, or in Denmark and I can't think of a city beginning with D but if there were a um, uh, we don't know that specificity at a global level but interrogation situational analysis in Dakar in Denmark, in um, uh, other cities and countries, know what the priority issues are. And that's why I think that there needs to be a situational analysis, a rapid assessment of where are we now with what we're doing on physical activity and what are the major barriers to people being active. Let's prioritize what we can start to work on in the next two or three years. And then there are some obviously important things which are a bit more challenging, whether that's just due to resources or even expertise. Uh, and they are put on the mid-term uh, uh, agenda for the action plan of that country. And I think over time, and with the kind of support researchers are interested in, we'll be able to evaluate which countries have done which combination. This, in fact, provides a way of communicating across the global community of the different interventions people are doing. But much more work needs to be done to in, improve um, the, uh, the, the specificity of the, um, uh, the communications. So uh, many would know that I can rattle off the numbers. That's 3.2 or 4.1. I don't think we want to enter a world that's um, quite um, like that, but maybe that might help us in terms of going forward. But the monitoring framework will show us how to assess. When we assess, we'll start to see the patterns that different countries are, are implementing and their impact on their levels of physical activity. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, Fiona. We've actually had a number of questions coming, which I'm very sorry we won't have a, a chance to ask you, but I will forward them all through so you can um, have a look and see the types of questions that have been coming through from those on the webinar. Um, I would like to take the time to thank you today for sharing with you, for sharing with us, um, I guess, your journey through developing this plan and thank you for your leadership on it. Um, all of us, I think, are very uh, enthused and motivated to go away and to try and um, see what we can do from our perspective. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time today. Uh, I think it was a very exciting webinar uh, to have and um, I really enjoyed listening and I'm sure everybody else did too. So before we conclude, I'd just like to remind everyone that um, we will be emailing a survey through, so please look out for that. And also do a short plug for the next ISPA webinar, which would be taking place in mid-September with a date to be confirmed. And the topic of that webinar will be around disseminating research for impact. So I hope you will join us for that one as well. But lastly, thank you, Fiona. We really enjoyed it and um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone for joining and I look thank forward to your contributions.